Hello, and welcome to the section of the course dealing with issues in metaphysics. In the section of the course dealing with issues in epistemology, I presented something of a roadmap of some of the major areas of epistemology and some of the, the major issues uh, that have been uh, issues that have, that have drawn a lot of focus over the years. Uh, I can't really do that in metaphysics because in terms of the topics that are included, it's just too big. Uh, if I did something like a, a roadmap, uh, it wouldn't be so much of branching out as, as lots and lots of little islands. Uh, and if I thought for um, for a solid week and worked on it for a solid week, I think I might be able uh, to get the the majority of topics in metaphysics that have, that have generated a lot of attention. But I'd still miss a lot. Um, so it's just um, it's just a little bit too big for that kind of approach. But what I will do is I will give you an idea of what kinds of methods that we use to do metaphysics. Uh, and I'd like to give you something of a broad overview of what makes something a topic in metaphysics, uh, as well as to at least hit some uh, prominent examples of metaphysical disputes uh, in the examples I give of some of the methods uh, that are used in metaphysics. This is a slide you've uh, seen before, but we uh, only went through it very, very briefly early in the term. I'd like to spend a little bit more time, go into a little bit more detail on some of these things. Uh, just a, as a, a general category, uh, metaphysics deals with uh, anything that concerns uh, questions about existence, essence, and meaning. And of course, I think there are probably some other things that you could you could say, oh no, that t totally fits in metaphysics, even though it, uh, you know, may not be directly related to existence, essence, or meaning. But pretty much every time you're dealing with existence, essence, or meaning, you're definitely in metaphysics. And a good number of metaphysical topics uh, involve at least one of these three. Sometimes even sometimes more than more than just one of the three. Uh, you'll notice there's some degree of overlap. So first, let's mention existence. Um, uh, questions involving existence include the question, what exists? Uh, or why is there something rather than nothing? Uh, or, you know, there are a great many questions about existence. You can spend multiple careers in philosophy talking or thinking about existence. Uh, and if that doesn't sound like a very tricky or difficult question, uh, you know, think of some some examples. Uh, so, uh, you know, on, on the one hand, one of my favorite examples is, is the equator, right? I think I may have mentioned this one before. Uh, I mean, does the equator exist? Right. Um, well, I mean, in some sense it does, and in some sense it doesn't. Uh, uh, the sense in which it does is you can say true things about the equator. Um, you know, you can say false things about it. There's something very objective about, uh, you know, its properties. And yet you can't bring me a spoonful of it. You can't tell me what it tastes like. You know, there's uh, a sense in which it's definitely not part of the sort of physical furniture of the universe. But, you know, there you go. Uh, uh, you know, things like numbers. Do numbers exist, right? Um, in the sense that like you can, you can, you know, see them or touch them or something like that. It's like, well, no, but uh, there might be a sense in which they do. And so when you're, when you're arguing about, you know, what, what do you even mean by existence? This is where we get to the meaning part. Uh, and so that's what I meant when I said that some of these issues overlap. So sometimes when you're talking about existence, you're also talking about what it means for something to exist. And there are plenty of difficult examples. Uh, there are plenty of of uh, uh, real, real puzzlers um, in, uh, in in existence, but but anytime you're talking about existence in, in many in many many of its forms, uh, you're dealing with issues in metaphysics. Uh, the same goes for when you are asking questions about essence. Uh, questions about essence are uh, questions about you know what is the nature of thingy, right? Why is thingy the way it is and not some other way? Uh, that's that's what a question about essence is. Uh, what is it that makes something what it is? Uh, and of course, the, the the variety of of different questions about essence that you can run into is is staggering. Uh, you can talk about you know what what is the the essence of of humanity? What is it that makes uh, someone human? In in you know and again, in what sense? What do you mean by human? Do you mean in a kind of um, in a kind of 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 moral sense? You know uh, that we, the the kind that we talk about when we mean human rights, or do you mean in a more like biological sense when you talk about a human being? Uh, how it distinguishes 
distinguishes us from from uh, creatures in the past that were very similar to us, um, and uh, you know uh, that sort of a thing. Uh, you can again, there are many, many, many possible questions about essence, uh, and I could go on and on and on about them. But anytime you're dealing with essence, when you're dealing with the nature of something, like you know what makes it what it is, uh, those are all questions about essence. So one of my uh, one of the examples I use often uh, when talking about questions about essence is um, it's a good it's a good example of a question about essence, but I it's not uh, a question that as far as I'm aware of anybody actually cares about the answer to. Uh, the only reason I bring it up is because it it uh, if you're not quite sure what somebody means by questions of essence, I think it does illustrate what a question of essence really is like. And so uh, here's a question for you. Uh, would frogs be frogs if they were pink instead of green or whatever color they are? Uh, again, nobody really cares as far as I know about the answer to that question, but it is definitely a question about essence. All right, you're asking about the nature of frogginess, right? And so there's two ways of answering the question. There's yes and no, right? So you might say, yes, frogs would still be frogs even if they were pink. And what you're saying, if you're saying that, is that it is not in the nature of frogs, right, uh, to um, uh, to be a certain color, right? Uh, that is, that, that color is not part of the essence of a frog. It's not part of what makes the frog what it is, right? Uh, now, you could also say no, right? You could say, you know, frogs would not be frogs if they were pink. And if, if that's the way you're answering the question, then you're saying that part of the essence of a frog is its color, right? It wouldn't be the same thing if it were pink instead of green. Um, and so again, I, I'm not going to supply any arguments for either of those positions. Uh, but if you're if you are arguing about those things, you are arguing about essence, um, and uh, uh, and and you're deeply, deeply, firmly in metaphysics. And finally, uh, there are questions about meaning. And again, we mean we mean uh, we talk about meaning in this sense. We what we mean by meaning is uh, in the most, much more prosaic sense of what does the word X mean? Like what what you know what are we what are we saying when we say some particular word? Uh, really, that's what are we thinking when we say a certain word? Like what's the meaning of our concept? What is the actual content of the idea? Um, you know what is it that we're talking about? And uh, this is very necessary when you're dealing with complicated and 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 and, uh, difficult issues uh, in philosophy, but but anytime you're talking about what what a word really means or what a concept really entails, uh, so for example, when you were thinking about uh, whether the equator exists, you say, well, that depends what you mean by exist. What does ex what does it mean to exist? Well, this is where uh, questions in metaphysics deal with meaning. Uh, you know, what does uh, existence mean? What does essence mean? Um, what does what does the nature of something mean? Um, and so, uh, yeah, we, we're not we don't mean so much as in what is the meaning of life. That's more of a question in value to the extent that that question makes any sense. But anytime you're thinking about um, about meaning, you're you're definitely in metaphysics. And I should say here that uh, one common idea that people sometimes get about philosophy in general and metaphysics in particular is that we're spending so much time arguing about words, right? And, and that's a mistaken impression. Of course, when we're arguing, we must use words, right? We can't just stare at each other and make like, you know, hand, you know, uh, like, like, it's not charades, right? I mean, I guess we could do it that way. It would be really, really inefficient and probably not very productive. It might be fun, but uh, we're not going to play charades. At each we're going to talk to each other. We're going to write things down uh, in, in a very careful way. We're going to read what other people write. And so, yes, we can't get away from using language for all this, but that doesn't mean that what we're talking about is just exhausted by by talking about about language as if as if it didn't matter, uh, because when when we're talking about words, we're not really talking about the word. We're talking about what the word refers to, and that's really the substance of the debate. Uh, so just just to to use an example from 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 value theory from ethics, which but does have something of an overlap into metaphysics, at least in terms of a discussion about meaning. Um, you you might ask different people uh, uh, whether abortion counts as murder or not. Well, notice on one level, yeah, we're talking about words, but it really matters, right? Whether, uh, whether, for example, abortion counts as murder. If it, if it, if it does, right? Well, then it would 
clearly be wrong in most cases. And if it doesn't, right, then it would not necessarily be wrong in, in most or many cases. Uh, but, you know, again, we're not just arguing about the word as if it's just some random assignment. We're arguing about what the word refers to. We're arguing about actions. We're arguing about values, uh, what they really are. Um, and so it, again, it's we're not we're not ever arguing just about which word to apply to something. Uh, you know, the word matters. We're we're arguing about what things really mean, like what what the content of some concept really is. Uh, and so as a result, some of these uh, disputes are really among the most important we have, uh, and they're not at all trivial. So now I'd like to turn our attention to how we do metaphysics in general. And uh, one thing about uh, that, that all metaphysical uh, debate has in common is that it's all in one way, shape, or form a kind of conceptual analysis. That is, it's an analysis of our concepts. It's about our ideas. Right. And so what we need is to is some methods uh, right, for figuring out how good or bad our, our ideas are. Right. Or at the very least, how well certain ideas do or don't fit together. Uh, right. So if an idea just doesn't fit with so many of the ideas that we have. Well, that is in some sense evidence that maybe it's not a very good idea, uh, or maybe if an idea fits with all of uh, you know our best ideas, the ideas that seem to be most obvious to us, that might be some evidence that it's a fairly good idea. Um, and so again, we need we need some methods for trying to determine when an idea is a good one and when it's a bad one, or at least when it's better and worse. And those involve uh, a number of, of, of things, but the first of those is, that I'm going to talk about later is uh, the notion of checking for internal consistency. So if we have an idea, we want to make sure that that idea, in some sense, uh, doesn't have any problems within the idea itself. That is, that it doesn't have any problem following its own rules, or that there's not some weird contradiction or paradox sort of just hiding in it. Um, if there is, then there's a problem with the internal consistency of an idea. Uh, that is, it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't obey its own rules in some sense, um, and uh, that's always a problem for an idea. If an idea is not internally consistent, uh, that's always going to be evidence that uh, we should look for a better idea. That 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 idea is not not what we want another tool that we have to see uh, whether our ideas seem to be better or seem to be worse is that we use analogical argument um, so uh, you know an analogy is something that is usually used to explain uh, uh, you know the similarity uh, be between things or to use the similarity between things to sort of enhance our understanding that's the the real purpose of an analogy um, and so uh, analogical arguments are basically uh, ways where we can imagine, uh, you know, different scenarios. And we can say, okay, so is the scenario we're, we're, we're thinking about, is it more like this or is it more like that, right? It's where we're trying to use things that we understand better uh, to, 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 to help us understand things that we don't understand as well. So uh, if we can take something we understand pretty well and say this thing we understand poorly is actually a lot like it, well, then all of a sudden we understand that thing a little bit better. And so that's really the purpose of analogical arguments is to try and figure out uh, what some of these difficult questions are are more like, if they are more like some easier questions. Uh, and that's uh, that's where analogical argument comes in. And uh, I'll, we'll, I'll give you some examples of each of these things uh, as, as we go forward. But the third tool that uh, I'm going to end up talking about is uh, the notion of a thought experiment. This is uh, this is the bread and butter of of uh, argument and metaphysics of trying to figure out how good or or how or how bad our ideas are. And uh, when I talk about thought experiments, I mean I mean I'm really experiments, right? The idea is behind a good thought experiment is to say, all right, let's take this idea and let's put it into a situation and see what happens. And if what happens when we put a particular idea into a particular situation is that we end up having to say things that sound ridiculous, well, that might be evidence that the idea wasn't actually that good, right? Uh, or if we put an idea into a situation and it and it all of a sudden makes a lot of sense out of that situation, well, that might be some evidence that our idea was was better. 
Um, the point behind a, a thought experiment is that you, you do have to construct them well, right? You have to design them well, and you have to make sure that they're only checking one thing at a time, uh, right? Just just like an experiment that you're familiar with uh, in, you know, like science fairs or things like that. Uh, and uh, just in case you're thinking to yourself, oh, really? So, so like philosophy here is taking a cue from science and using a scientific method to evaluate arguments in philosophy. No, that's not at all what's going on here. Rather, uh, so we were we were doing this first, and it's science that uses a philosophical method to examine their field, right? So science is philosophical in this way. Philosophy is not scientific in this way. Um, the reason that sciences use an experimental method is because it's rational, and that's the same reason we use the same method in metaphysics. So let's take a look at uh, some examples of each of these things. And I've, I've uh, supplied an example of an issue in metaphysics that you can spend an entire career in if you'd like to. Um, and uh, each of them is going to illustrate one kind of metaphysical uh, examination. And so my favorite example of checking something for internal consistency is uh, the notion of time travel. All right. And so what I'd like you to do is I'd like to imagine that you, you, you yourself are, are an expert on the year 1955, right? You have spent years and years, decades studying 1955, right? You, you teach at a college, you teach a class called 1955, right? It's, imagine it's a three semester class. So there's like part one, two, and three, right? You know, uh, that, that, you know, that's just, just three on 1950. So three semesters you can fill up with, with, with information about, you know, you are the world's leading expert on 1955. You, you know, you know it really, really well. Okay. Um, and so imagine that, um, so you you know you somebody you know uh, perhaps an, an an old man with crazy hair invents um invents or says he invents anyway a time machine right that he maybe builds into a car or something like that and uh and 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 promises that that all you have to do is use this time machine and it will take you to 1955 and of course they'd want to send you you're the one with the most interest in 1955 so um you know you're you're the ideal candidate to to go explore this thing and of course the question is how would you know that your time machine worked Right. When I ask rooms full of people this question, uh, almost inevitably, one of the first answers someone says, look at a newspaper, right? Because that's what they always do in the movies, right? Somebody looks at a newspaper, looks at the date on top of it. But of course, you'd do more than that, right? Uh, I mean, that sort of thing could be so easily faked, right? But everything else, everything else seems like you, you'd really, you'd, you'd start piling up evidence, right? You'd see the kind of cars that people drove. You'd look at the clothes that they wore. You'd hear the way that they talked because, of course, you know, uh, slang changes over time. Uh, the, the, the words that people use change over time, the ways that people use them, um, you know, the, 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 the architecture, you know, you'll, you, you know, you know, certain buildings that were built by that time and certainly that, that weren't, or some buildings that were still standing at that time and some that aren't, um, you know, you'll know who's in political office in, 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 at this particular time, you'll know who's alive at that particular time and how old they would be, all sorts of things. Okay. And so you, you, you just, you know, again, if you're the expert, you'd, you'd look for all of those things. And the more of those things that seem to match, the more you're going to say, well, my goodness, this time machine's seems like it worked. I really am in 1955. So um, I, I've, I've put here just a, a little cartoon. You can sort of read this um, because it's 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 an, an hilarious cartoon from XKCD, uh, which I encourage you to visit. It's a it's a really excellent, very intellectual <laughs> web comic. Uh, and uh, it just this just you know uh, talks about uh, some of the the major plot holes that very very often appear in in really every time travel movie, uh, which should always kind of tell us that maybe there's something about time travel that, that, that essentially doesn't make sense. Um, but in addition to that, I, I want to return to our example about 1955 uh, to really illustrate the trouble that we sometimes, that, that, that concepts of time travel have with internal consistency, that is, with following their own rules. Uh, if you want to, if you want to just pause the video and read the comic, this is the, this is the time to do that. It's, it's very funny. Okay, if you're back and have had a nice laugh at the cartoon. So 
the idea is this. Okay, imagine that all the evidence that you see, like in the cars that people are driving, the clothes that people are wearing, the things that they're saying, uh, you know, the events that they're talking about happening, the things that are in the newspaper aside from just the date, all that sort of stuff. Uh, is it, it all says that you're in 1955, you know, and, and it all fits with what you know about 1955, except for one thing. One of the newspaper stories that you read uh, sort of contradicts something that you know to have been true of 1955. So say, for example, it talks about the uh, attorney general of the United States as being someone named Smith, and you know very much it was somebody named Jones in 1955. You know this, right? And so you think, okay, maybe maybe the newspaper writer made a mistake. And so you go to the public library, because this is what you would have done in 1955, to find information of this kind. You look it up, right? Who is the current attorney general of the United States? And, and sure enough, there, it, it says Smith also, right? And so then you start asking around. And of course, most people have no idea who the attorney general of the United States at any given time is. But you'll find at least some people who, who really do pay attention to such things. Uh, and, and and they say, oh, no, yeah, it's it's Smith. And you're like, are you sure it's not Jones? And they're like, who? <laughs> right? And they're like, no, no, it's, been, it's always been Smith, right? Or at least since in, in this particular presidential administration right and so uh, you know the question is right again just like you know make sure that there, there's it's not just some mistake it's some, some isolated error it really does seem like this is a genuine discrepancy but, but between something that you knew was true of 1955 and uh, that 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 seems not to be true of whatever world you're, you're in at the moment and so the question is what should that convince you of And I think it seems fairly clear that it should convince you that whatever that machine did, it's not exactly time travel. It's probably something else, right? Because if it were time travel, well, then you would be in a world in which Smith was the Attorney General of the United States and not Jones, or Jones and not Smith. I don't actually don't remember how I said it before, but you know, you can rewind and check. Um, so the idea is, is that, you know, again, that this, if there's a genuine discrepancy, right? You knew it was one way, everybody in this world, it really is in this world the other way. I mean, imagine driving all the way to DC, like going to the office, this person is like, yep, okay, nobody's making a mistake here. It really is just a, a, a real discrepancy. Again, that should convince you that whatever this machine is doing, it's not time travel, right? One fact really should be enough to convince you, uh, a, a real discrepancy should be enough to convince you uh, that whatever that machine did, it's, it's not time travel, okay? We're good here. All right. Now, if you uh, give yourself like a, you know, five, you know, uh, super mega bonus points, if you already see the trouble, uh, but if you, if you don't, here's the trouble. Um, he here's another thing. Here's another fact that you absolutely know about 1955. You weren't there. Okay, and so if one discrepancy between the way 1955 actually is that you're 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 walking around in is enough to convince you that whatever that machine does, it's not time travel. Well, the fact that you're there when you know that you weren't there, it's enough. It should be enough to convince you that whatever that machine does, it's not time travel. Um, and so again, it seems like time travel has a really really hard time just simply following its own rules. And this is of course to say nothing of some of the very famous paradoxes that are generated uh, if you allow something like time travel to be possible uh, to say nothing of the grammar actually the grammar might be one of the worst parts like uh, you you have to have you know new I mean what what's the proper tense for being about to do something that you actually did in the past uh, but that you'll do in the future of you know it, it yeah it, what what tense do you use for that very very difficult very bizarre okay so uh, here's a second uh, tool that uh, metaphysicians use uh, to to try and make progress on some of these issues uh, in metaphysics, many of which, uh, if, if, they've, if they've stayed around as issues for a long time, they're, they're very, very difficult issues, they're thorny issues. Um, but uh, we, again, we can make some progress, uh, we can advance the state of discussion, we can at least eliminate uh, some positions if they seem to have serious problems. Uh, but one of the tools, one of the other tools we use, in addition to checking, uh, to see if an idea follows its own rules, to see if if it's internally consistent, is we see, all right, what is, what is, what is it, what is it like, right? Um, uh, is, 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 is what we're thinking of like some other thing that we understand better, and, and, and does that help us? So the issue that I 
uh, want to talk about with regard to analogical argument is another major issue you can spend multiple careers in philosophy exploring, uh, and that's the issue of personal identity. Okay. Now, when I say identity, I don't mean that the way that we tend to use the word identity in everyday life, right? When people say, oh, well, you know, my, my, uh, uh, my cultural heritage is part of my identity, or the town I grew up in, or the neighborhood I'm from is part of my identity, right? That's that's actually not quite what philosophers mean when they talk about identity. Uh, what what philosophers mean in this case is just the sen the the sense of being the same thing over time and through change, right? So if you have a wrist, say you're wearing a wristwatch, right, uh, today there's something that makes that the same watch that you had yesterday, <laughs> okay? And whatever, it's that relation that we mean when we talk about identity. Identity is the relation that things have with themselves only, right? That is, there is only one thing in the universe that, that is me, and that is me, right? So uh, again, uh, the, 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 the thing that I have that identity relation with um, is myself and myself only. And so the question is then, what is it that makes uh, a person's the same over time and through change? Because of course, time does progress. Uh, people do undergo various kinds of changes. And if there is a sense in which, uh, you know, you are the same person, you know, uh, today as you were yesterday, I mean, again, you will have had some changes, but you 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 want to say, look, no, no, no. There's there's there, I bear an identity relation with uh, with 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 this person that existed yesterday, right? I'm sure you've probably all uh, have a photograph of yourself when you were like say eight or something like that, and you point yourself, say, hey, that was me when I was eight. What you're doing there is you're making an identity assertion. You're saying that uh, you know there's only one thing in the universe that that bears the the identity relation to that person in the photograph, and that is that's me. So um, that's what we mean by identity. We don't mean it in this sort of, you know, looser sense of uh, uh, how we sort of describe ourselves or something like that. Um, so there are two ideas about what grounds identity uh, over time and through change. Uh, one of those ideas is known as bodily identity theory. That is the theory that human beings are uh, persons, or that persons are their bodies. Right. And this has something going for it in that, you know, if, if you say, for example, promise to meet your friend at a restaurant, um, uh, you know, for lunch, and I'm sure everyone's been been through this, you get to the restaurant and you wonder whether you you got there first or whether your friend did. Right. Uh, one of the things you'll probably do is look around the restaurant. Notice what you're looking for. You're looking for their body. When you see your friend's body, you will assume that you have found your friend. OK. The idea is that, yes, people's bodies do change over time, but that change is gradual. And it does seem that objects can survive gradual change while still being the same object. Right. Um, and. Uh, and so that's the idea that we, we, we each have a body. We get, you know, one body each and. That's what we are. We're a body that changes over time, all right? Well, that's one way of thinking about it. Another way of thinking about it is that we are uh, we we are a set of psychological properties, right? Uh, that is, we're minds in some sense. And uh, so, I mean, if you've ever gotten a, a you know sort of a new phone, or or maybe one of friends got a new phone and then texts you and you don't recognize who it is, or they call you on the phone and you answer and you, you don't recognize you know you don't immediately recognize their voice, uh, but they sort of assume that you should know who they are, and so you know you start to try and string out the conversation instead of trying just to like you know maybe offend them by just saying yeah, who this right you know, <laughs> uh, so so the idea is again you're trying to use your psychological properties to try and figure out who they are right. So, yeah, I mean, things like, you know, DNA test fingerprints, all this stuff assumes something like bodily identity, whereas like, you know, passwords and security questions and all that sort of stuff assumes something like psychological identity theory. And, and most of the time, ordinary people walk around with some blend of these things in their minds. Uh, but of course, um, you know, philosophers want to try and separate the two different ideas out and try and see which one in some sense makes more, more sense, right? Or which one performs better given certain kinds of arguments or tests. And the real trouble in, is that in, in real life, um, in, in everybody's actual experience, um, bodies and psychologies are not separable. That is, every, everywhere your body goes, there your psychology goes too, you know? And so there's no situations in real life that, that tend to um, 
that tend to settle this question really are, are, are able to provide any kind of evidence in any way. And uh, so what we do is we have to try and imagine situations in which uh, uh, bodies and psychologies could come apart. And we say, all right, so let's say if, if we did separate bodies and psychologies, what would it be more like? Like what would, what would happen, right? And this is where we can sort of explore uh, uh, these kind of ideas to see what sort of consequences they have, uh, to see if they naturally lead us in one direction or another. So here's one such example involving personal identity in a way that we try and make sort of bodies and psychologies separable. Uh, and I'm, I'm talking, of course, of the very famous uh, either, you know, brain switching or body switching cases, right? Um, so, so here's the thing. Wh whether you refer to it as a brain switch or a body switch actually depends on whether you think the bodily identity theory is right or whether you think the psychological identity theory is right. Okay, so a brain switch is what you do if you think that the per people are their bodies. Right. That is, you think you have a body and that you simply got a different brain. Right. Uh, but if you are a fan of the psychological theory, then you call it a body swap because you keep your brain. You just get it. You just get a different body. Right. So that's part of the, the trouble already. But let's just you know spell out the, the example. So imagine that Garcia, who is a lobbyist. Right. That is someone who um, tries to convince legislators to, to do this, that or the other thing or vote one way or the other on certain issues um, by presenting arguments and studies and, you know, like talking to them, th that sort of thing. Um, so, again, imagine Garcia, who is a lobbyist, conspires, right, to have his brain or body, depending on who shows, switched with that of Hernandez, who is a senator in order to swing an important vote, right? So a, a vote that's very important to Garcia, the lobbyist. Um, and so the idea is that you take Garcia's brain and put it in Hernandez's body, or, or uh, you know, you have uh, Garcia sort of take, right, Hernandez's brain, one of the two. Um, so, but that's the idea. You have either a brain slash body swap. And uh, the question is, what, 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 what happens in that case, what would that actually be like to separate uh, body and psychology in this way? And it seems like there are a couple of possibilities, and we can we can argue about which one makes the better analogy, right? What what would it, what would it be more like? So is the result of this that the lobbyist is now in the senator's body, right? So they they look different and they sound different, but they really are the lobbyist. Right. And so when they cast their vote in the Senate, in a sense, they've gotten away with something because they're not really a senator. They're really a lobbyist. Does that make sense? Um, that's, that's one way things could turn out. And that's usually when you see this kind of a scenario in the movies, that's usually just what they assume. Um, but 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 that may not be correct. Right. Again, don't don't rely on screenwriters to, to do your philosophy for you. They generally don't know anything. In fact, don't rely on screenwriters for anything. Um, they generally don't know anything. So, um, I mean, look, is it, you know, so, so that's one possibility. The other possibility is, is it is it the case now that the senator, you know, Hernandez is still Hernandez, right, still is a senator, just now falsely believes that that they used to be a lobbyist. Right. They got all these delusional or false memories from, you know, having from from a, you know, a, a, a brain swap. Right. So due to a brain surgery, they, they ended up with all of these ideas that they used to be a lobbyist. But of course, they're not. They're still they're They're a senator. They're still Hernandez. Um, and they just now have, you know, they just now have a lot of false beliefs. <laughs> so, I mean. It's, it's very interesting that that, uh, you know, uh, I think there's some some. Uh, compelling arguments to be made about each of these things, but that's the point, right? It's to say, okay, which um, uh, which situation is more like what would happen, right? What what bears closer analogy do we think uh, to the way we we really do think about identity and what what uh, what causes it? And again, this is a metaphysical question, and um, uh, it, again, because it's a question about our ideas. Uh, observation, as a matter of fact, doesn't help. Like so, even this, this is just a totally imaginary thing. Uh, even if we if we actually did this, if we had the capability to do brain or body swaps, um, we would still have to decide what the result is without having to look. I mean, because of course, you know, you could ask 
write the senator, you know, are you Garcia the lobbyist? And of course, they would say yes, but does that mean that that's true? They actually are the lobbyist? Or does that mean, well, they say that they believe they're Garcia because they now have Garcia's brain. That is, they have false memories of having used to been Garcia due to a brain surgery. Um, so, I mean, again, like observation actually doing this, if we could do this, wouldn't, wouldn't help. It wouldn't settle the metaphysical question. We have to settle the metaphysical question with very, very careful analysis of our ideas, um, because that's what that's what that is that's what the question is about. And so, speaking of our ideas, uh, I want to progress to uh, uh, the 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 major way that uh, that philosophers tend to address uh, ideas in metaphysics, um, and that is by the the use of thought experiments. That is, uh, we create a situation uh, to test out our ideas, right? To see how much sense our ideas make. And as with any good experiment, you want you want to test one thing at a time. Right. Otherwise, it, the, the result of the experiment is really unclear. And so uh, really well-crafted thought experiments are, are beautiful, beautiful things. Um, and so uh, I, I'd like to talk to you about one of the most famous thought experiments in the last hundred years or so. Uh, it's one you've probably even heard of, although I think it's probably doubtful that you know precisely what the thought experiment was supposed to demonstrate or supposed to prove. Uh, but but I'll, I'll try and make that clear. And so just some background here, uh, in, in the early days of the development of quantum mechanics, which is a, a branch of physics, uh, physicists used to say, and many still actually do use this language, they used to say that particles, uh, that is little tiny bits of subatomic, you know, particles in that sense, are uh, in what they called a superposition until some observation, quote, collapses the wave function. It's like, what does that all mean? Uh, well, uh, you know, basically the idea is that, uh, you know, imagine some particle could be in one of two states, right? Or it could have uh, one of two kinds of what they call spin, which isn't literally spin, but it's a proper, it's the name of a, of a, of a physical property that, that uh, subatomic particles can be measured to have, right? So imagine it could have spin, the, the, the spin up or spin down, right? But you don't know until you actually measure it. And, and one of the things that they, that, Again, certain physicists used to say, and many still do, they say something like, oh, no, well, it's it actually has both states at the same time, right? It's a superposition where it has both spin up and spin down until you make some kind of an observation. And what that does is collapses the wave function, which then, you know, then it actually has a spin, uh, just either one or the other, up or down, depending on uh, on what you measured. Um, and, and this made a lot of folks uh, sort of uneasy. Uh, and one of the people it made uneasy uh, was a, a a physicist by the name of Irvin Schrödinger, um, and, and and with that name you're like, oh, this is that one, right? And so yeah, yeah it's that one. Uh, but uh, Dr. Schrödinger was himself responsible, right, for discovering the mathematics of wave functions, right? And so is you know, one of these pioneers of quantum mechanics. It's not he wasn't. He wasn't skeptical about quantum mechanics. What he was skeptical about uh, was, uh, was was some of the way that people were thinking about and thus talking about quantum mechanics. And so he objected to this terminology about superpositions and you know collapsing of wave functions, that, that sort of thing, especially the idea of superpositions. Uh, and, and some of the ideas that that terminology reflected. And, and, and so it's important to note when he was doing this, um, he was not really doing physics, right? He was not making any actual experiments. Um, he was not uh, no, trying to design some sort of experimental apparatus. And in fact, if you were to actually do the, uh, the, 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 the thought experiment in question, it wouldn't tell you anything, right? Uh, again, it's a, it's a thought experiment. He was, he was actually doing metaphysics. He was, he was trying to examine uh, ideas uh, for their plausibility, um, and, and that's, you know, so of course you have to use the tools of metaphysics when doing that, and he did. So here's the, the, the way that the thought experiment works. And so he says, uh, so Schrodinger put it this way. Uh, so uh, imagine a setup where uh, you have a, a sort of a particle detector, right? Let me turn on a little laser pointer here. So, so you've got this detector. 
right? And what this does is it just monitors um, a, 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 a radioactively unstable molecule, right? Because one of the things that happen is that the elements that are radioactive, they eventually decay. That is, uh, they sort of split apart and they form two different elements other than the one they were because they're unstable. And, uh, you know, radioactive decay is a little bit unpredictable. It's a little bit like, um, you know, watching a, a kernel of popcorn, you know, eventually it's going to pop. It's just, you know, saying exactly when it's not like, you know, it's not like it takes a certain amount of time for every kernel of popcorn. It's a little different for every one. And it's, it seems pretty random. So that's, it's a good analogy anyway, uh, to, to, to thinking about radioactive decay, right? Um, if it was really super regular, um, then when you popped popcorn, they would all just, you know, like reach a certain point, you know, like say, uh, you know, like three, four minutes on the hot plate. And then all of a sudden, boom, they'd all just pop, right? That's not how it works, right? There's this sort of, you know, uh, sense in which they, they, you know, there's, they'll cluster around a certain time, but you know, it's a little random. That's the way that you can think of radioactive decay. It's a little, it's a little bit um, unpredictable in that sense. So, so the idea is what this detector does is it, is it monitors that molecule and then just whenever it decays, it'll send a signal to this switch, which will break a vial of poison gas, which would kill a cat, right? And you put this whole thing into a box, uh, really to keep the cat from wandering away. And, um, and of course, this is one of the reasons you would never consider actually doing this experiment, right? Because it'd be inhumane. And also, it wouldn't tell you anything, right? So the point is, he says, okay, so 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 imagine you've got this sealed away box. You can't see it, right? And if you think that this radioactive, you know, uh, uh, element is in a superposition, that is, that it has both decayed and not decayed before you observe it to make some measurement, then what happens, that then you'll have to say in that box that the cat is both alive and dead at the same time. And if you don't think that makes any sense to say that a cat really is, really, really is both alive and dead at the same time, notice physicists do not say, right, uh, who, you know, who are involved in this version of quantum mechanics, they do not say, for all you know, the cat could be alive or could be dead that's not what they mean or not, certainly not what they say they say no, no 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 the cat is in a superposition it is both alive and dead in that box um and if that again if that sounds ridiculous then you get Irvin schrodinger's basic intuition here and so notice what's happened is that schrodinger has has constructed a a a, a a setup, right? A, a thing to think about, a thought experiment that seems like it makes us say something absurd. And that maybe makes us think that the, the, the sort of the way of talking about or thinking about quantum mechanics in terms of, you know, superpositions and, and all that sort of stuff, uh, there may be something wrong with that, right? There may be actually better ways of doing things. And in fact, there are other interpretations of quantum mechanics that use different terminology uh, and not, uh, you know, then, then don't talk about superposition, things like that. It don't seem to have this effect of having this cat be both alive and dead in the box. All right, so like I said, it's one of the most famous thought experiments of the last hundred years. Uh, so famous, you've probably heard, right, of of the Schrodinger's cat thought experiment. But again, I, it, you know, if you have, if you didn't know what it was supposed to say, well, well, now you know. Uh, but but yes, it's a it's a famous thought experiment, and and all thought experiments work something like this, right? They all take an idea that we have, and then try and test test it in a certain situation to see if the idea makes us say something that we find fundamentally sensible or whether it makes us say something that we think maybe is fundamentally senseless. Uh, and that's how it generates evidence for our ideas being sort of better or, or worse. So uh, I wanted to uh, give you a, a, an idea about what we're going to be taking a look at ourselves. Um, we're going to be taking a look at a, another huge area of metaphysics, and that is uh, something known as the philosophy of mind. And so very specifically, we're going to be asking the question of what is a mind? Notice this is a kind of question about essence, right? What, what, what is the nature of mind? What makes it what it is? What features does it have? What is, what is it, right? We, we talk about minds pretty blithely, but, but what really are we talking about when we talk about a mind? And so we're going to uh, get some very broad perspectives on, on this view uh, or on this question and uh, uh, look, look into some of those perspectives to see how well they do. 
Um, we also uh, might consider how we should talk or think about minds and mental states, right? Uh, what seems to be true of it? What's the best way to conceptualize what a mind is uh, and what mental states are? And finally, what kinds of things actually have minds and which, kind, and which kinds of things don't? Have minds. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, what's become, uh, uh, just fairly lately again, uh, something of a, a hot topic in popular conversation, uh, and that is artificial intelligences. Uh, do these things really have minds, or do they really not have minds? And again, a lot of that depends on what is a mind, uh, which is a metaphysical question. And uh, and uh, so we're going to we're going to be taking a look at uh, some of the the basic issues there. Uh, here's a general map of the unit. Uh, we're going to be starting off with the question of what is a mind. And uh, the first source we're going to look at is going to be pretty familiar. We're going right back to René Descartes. We're, in fact, going to pick up exactly where we left him in uh, in, in the epistemology unit. Descartes' one of these uh, few, uh, the few thinkers we're actually going to see uh, in two different parts of the course. Uh, we're going to we're going to pick up where we left off and look at the second meditation, where in epistemology we read the first meditation. We're going to read the second one this time. And uh, uh, Descartes is going to have some interesting things to say about what what a mind is. And in fact, he's going to supply uh, a view known as substance dualism. Uh, now we're going to move away from that view, as it turns out, and we're going to sort of examine two possible alternatives. Um, one view that we're going to mention, uh, uh, but but won't really have time to look at in in a lot of detail, is a, a, a view known as immaterialism. Right, this uh, view is is mostly uh, was most well developed by a philosopher named George Berkeley, and uh, I would very much encourage you to look up. Uh, some things about Barclay, just just ask me and I can point you right at the, the relevant resources. Um, but uh, like I said, we'll, I'll mention it a number of times uh, throughout the, the course that this is an alternative, but we won't really be able to spend as much time on it as as, as I'd like. I mean, it's we only have so many class periods and, and there's, you know, I'm leaving out many things that, that, that I can't even mention. Um, but of course, the, the main, the other, uh, the other, uh, uh, option that we're going to take a look at is, is a, a view called uh, materialism. And in fact, there's more than one kind of materialism uh, that, uh, that that we're going to want to take seriously. One of those uh, uh, we're going to call the sort of mind-brain identity theory, and that's going to be uh, described um, by a, a, a 19th century thinker, actually, uh, that uh, named Thomas Henry Huxley. And we're going to read a bit from, from him uh, to that sort of describes the essence of, of the mind-brain identity view. Uh, and also there's a view known as functionalism, um, which uh, we'll read a little bit about and uh, talk a little, talk about sort of what, what it entails, what sort of a view it is. And then we're going to turn our attention to the question of what has a mind. Uh, and, and for here, we're going to pull in two different, uh, uh, very important pieces of writing. Uh, one of them, uh, which very much comes from a kind of functionalist tradition uh, by a, a fellow by the name of Alan Matheson Turing, who's uh, pictured in a little tiny picture there. And uh, we're going to take a look at a pretty famous uh, a work by a philosopher named John Searle, uh, who I think very much comes out of something like the mind-brain identity tradition. And uh, we'll see that sort of the tension between these two pieces and uh, the arguments between these two uh, sort of materialist views of what a mind is. Um, so again, that's just a brief roadmap. Uh, you know, much of that won't like make sense until we really get there. Uh, but uh, just so you can uh, keep this in a broader context, uh, that's uh, that's uh, that's where we're headed. Uh, so uh, I, I I hope you're looking forward uh, to uh, taking a look at some issues in metaphysics uh, using some of the tools that we use uh, to get clearer about how good or bad our ideas are. And uh, I certainly am. And uh, when 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 I, we return, uh, we'll uh, start right off with Descartes, who is going to present us uh, with a view that's known as substance dualism. And we're uh, going to be able to see some of the troubles uh, that substance dualism has that makes us look for alternatives uh, to that view.